Genomic imprinting is a very fascinating phenomenon. It um, originates from the fact that um, all our cells uh, possess two copies of each gene. One copy is inherited from mom and the other copy is inherited from dad. So at fertilization, the egg and the sperm fuse their genomic information. And so um, we have half of our genome that is of maternal origin and half of paternal origin. In the, about in the 80s, 1980s, um, it was discovered that these two genes, these two set of genes, do not always behave the same way. And that is the phenomenon of genomic imprinting, which is certain genes are exclusively expressed from the maternal genome, and some genes are exclusively expressed from the paternal genome. This was discovered uh, by the early uh, mouse geneticists, in the mouse at least, where um, they were micromanipulating uh, the nucleus of an egg right after fertilization. And that stage, you can still distinguish the maternal pronucleus and the paternal pronucleus. So the egg and the sperm have just fused, and the two uh, uh, pronuclei that contain the maternal and paternal information have not fused yet, so they are distinguishable. So you can take a micropipette and you can remove one of the parental pronuclei and replace it by a second one that is identical to the one already there. So in essence, you can generate a zygote, an egg, that has two maternal pronuclei or two paternal pronuclei. In essence, you generate an embryo that instead of having maternal and paternal information has twice the maternal information, twice the paternal information. Now, surprisingly, these embryos do not survive. They, they die relatively quickly, they are unable to thrive, suggesting that there is a complementarity of the genomic information provided by mom and dad. Now, in principle, this is quite surprising because um, all the genes are there, both in the maternal genome and the paternal genome. And so the idea is that although the genes are there, all the genes are there, some are somehow repressed from one of the two uh, um, uh, parental genome. And that's the phenomenon of genomic imprinting. So why would you do this? Having two copies of every gene is an incredible, incredibly important safety mechanism. Because if there is a mutation in one gene, there is the second copy from the other parent that can come to the rescue. So why would you voluntarily repress one of the two genes? And David Haig, who is an evolutionary biologist here from Harvard, emitted the hypothesis that um, there's something special about imprinted genes. In fact, there's something special about organisms that uh, uh, undergo the phenomenon of genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting, um, is only observed in plants and in placental mammals. What's happening in placental mammals? Well, mom uh, uh, invests an enormous, res enormous resources um, into the growth of the embryo and, and the growth of the offspring. And so according to his hypothesis, this generates a battle between uh, mom and dad through their genome, such that dad would like its offspring to grow as much as possible. And so the paternal genome tend to promote embryonic growth. And mom, through her genome, uh, wants the embryo to grow, but not too much, because she needs to keep resources for all the progeny. And dad is not interested in all the progeny or um, future leaders or future infant, because those are likely to be from another dad. You know, the majority of uh, mammals are uh, polygamous. So mom has offspring from one dad and then has another set of offspring from a, a second dad. So dad obviously doesn't want uh, offspring from another dad. He wants to promote his own progeny. And so that's the idea, that there's this battle uh, between the maternal and the paternal genome. So this was only a hypothesis. And as it turns out, um, 
A couple of years later, the first imprinted genes were discovered, and the first uh, maternally expressed, sorry, the first paternally expressed genes is a growth factor called IGF2, and the first maternally expressed gene uh, discovered is an IGF2 receptor, which is a truncated receptor that impairs the function of IGF2. So here was, uh, to some extent, uh, the first demonstration of this hypothesis, which is uh, the gene expressed from Dan, IGF2, promotes embryonic growth, and the gene expressed from the maternal genome uh, impairs uh, or, or limits, I should say, embryonic growth. So this is the first set of imprinted gene discovered that fits this kinship theory. Other genes have been found that also fit this theory. Since then, uh, a very large number of genes have been discovered. Some fit this uh, uh, kinship conflict and some um, do not and fit very well with other theories that have been um, uh, emitted uh, around genomic imprinting. But so this is all about the embryo and the conflict in the embryo. As it turns out, from the hundred or so imprinted genes that have been discovered and that are important for embryonic growth, many of them, the majority of them, are expressed in the brain, in the adult brain. And so this really uh, triggered for us a very interesting question, which is, what are these imprinted genes doing in the brain? Is there a conflict in the brain between the maternal and the paternal genome, uh, the way there seem to be a conflict in the embryo? In other words, what are these imprinted genes doing? To some extent, this maternal-paternal conflict, uh, you could imagine some, uh, some sort of psychoanalysis reinvented, which is mom and dad uh, telling their offspring what to do, and they don't agree on what the offspring should be doing, so you have this conflict uh, in the brain. So uh, several year, a couple of years ago, actually five, five years ago, uh, we decided to try to uh, look at genomic imprinting in the brain. Since there are so many imprint, non-imprinted genes that are expressed there, could we even find more that are only imprinted in the brain? So we uh, developed a, a genome-wide strategy that is based on uh, new sequencing technologies, and <clears throat> we use this strategy to uh, identify all the repertoire of gene imprinted genes, so the imprintome, if you wish, of the embryonic brain, the adult cortex, and the adult hypothalamus. And to our surprise, uh, we identify a very large number of genes, uh, over a thousand genes. And what was interesting is that not only we found many genes that had never been reported to be imprinted before, but even more interestingly, we found that these genes were differentially imprinted in different brain regions. So some genes are imprinted in the embryo, some genes are imprinted in the cortex, some genes are imprinted in the hypothalamus, and many are not imprinted all over those uh, three brain areas. Since then, uh, we've looked at other brain areas. We also refine our, our uh, strategy. Um, Genome-wide expression analysis have enormously evolved, and the statistical analysis has also evolved. And we are now, uh, in, we have in our hand, uh, these very interesting genes that have a differential expression from the maternal and the paternal genome. So why is this important? Well, what we think is happening is that by silencing one of the two parental copies, uh, a neuron or a brain area is trying to regulate the dosage of certain genes and that the regulation of gene dosage is essential for proper brain function. In fact, there are quite a number of um, neurological diseases um, in which improper gene dosage leads to catastrophic uh, um, impairment of brain function. Uh, there are uh, many, many examples of, of, of such. And so we think that the genes that we have identified are preferentially expressed from either the maternal or the paternal genome. Uh, this preferential expression is not always very strong. It could be 60% from the maternal genome, 40% from the paternal genome, but many genes are affected. And so globally, um, these really may have a very strong impact on the way a neuron function. 
in a particular brain area. So the uh, next question really is indeed if we are uh, experimentally challenging the system, which means that if we artificially change the dosage of certain genes, uh, can we observe uh, changes in normal neuronal function? And what we also hope is that, um, as you know, there are many genome-wide analysis of polymorphism and trying to associate mutation in certain genes uh, with uh, certain mental disorders. And we think that the, um, the inheritance of some of these mutations from either the maternal lineage or the paternal lineage might have an enormous impact on how serious the disease will be. So if a gene, for example, is preferentially expressed from the maternal genome, if the mutation is inherited from mom, then this will have a, a larger effect on uh, neuronal function than if the mutation is inherited from the paternal lineage in which that particular gene is less expressed. So what we hope to, um, to be able to do is correlate more uh, tightly um, the origin of certain mutation together with the severity of, of certain diseases. Mm -hmm.